Good answer. Father Mark Steiner Dawn, continuing the course on the history of the Catholic Church in the United States and continuing the unit on the American Revolution. Picking up where we left off last time, seven months before retiring from the armed forces, General George Washington composed a, uh, a circular letter to the 13 former colonies. This letter, in retrospect, stands as a historical marker on the path toward a centralized federal government, of which Washington would become the first president. The letter read in part, quote, for according to the system of policy, the states shall adopt at this moment, that's uh, referring to the Articles of Confederation, they will stand or fall, and by their confirmation or lapse, it is yet to be decided whether the revolution must ultimately be considered a blessing or a curse. A not to the present age alone, for with our fate will the destiny of unborn millions be involved. There are four things which I humbly conceive, are essential to the well-being, I may even venture to say, to the existence of the United States as an independent power. First, an indissoluble union of the states under one federal head. Secondly, a sacred regard to public justice. Thirdly, the adoption of a proper peace establishment. And fourthly, the prevalence of that pacific and friendly disposition among the people of the United States, which will induce them to forget their local prejudices and policies, to make those mutual concessions which are requisite to the general prosperity, and in some instances, to sacrifice their individual advantages to the interests of the community. <clears throat> so, as we'll see, you know, Washington, uh, anyway, those are his words. It's, it's pretty self-explanatory. Same year, uh, June, uh, that, that letter was dated June 8th. 1783. On June 13th, 1783, the army, the Revolutionary Army, disbanded. This was the first, but not the last time, that the United States completely demobilized after a war, and later came to regret it when they, you know, faced another war. On November 25th, 1783, the last British troops sailed from New York to go back home. On December 23rd, 1783, uh, General Washington resigned his military commission and returned to civilian life. Uh, looking back as a summary, the colonies suffered 58,000 casualties fighting the revolution over seven years, including nine of the 56 men who signed the Declaration of Independence. So it was by no means a foregone conclusion. Great Britain recognized independence of uh, the U.S. with the boundaries of the, um, the St. Croix River dividing Maine from Nova Scotia, the 45th parallel to the Mississippi River, Spain, receive Florida from Britain as spoils for, for winning, for siding with the United States. So Spain got it back. You remember after the previous war, Spain lost Florida, so now Spain was on the winning side this time, so they got Florida back. Uh, the U.S., the new, new United States, were given right to fish in Canadian waters off of Newfoundland and Nova Scotia. 
all debts due to creditors of either country were considered valid and had to be repaid. Congress was pledged, now remember this is the Congress of the Articles of Confederation yet, not the Congress we think of. Congress was pledged to, quote, earnestly recommend to state legislatures the full restoration of rights and property to former loyalists, meaning those who, who fought against the revolution, sided with the English crown, uh, but decided to remain in the new nation. In other words, an amnesty, you know. Uh, this, uh, this was, of course, widely ignored as loyalists were deemed to have forfeited their property and states nationalized and those properties and nationalized just means theft it's when the uh, you know governments steal private property and uh the states did this and, and sold them new york for example gained 3.6 million dollars in 18th century money by doing this maryland raised two million dollars from such sale and, and on and on approximately 100,000 loyalists left the new United States uh, for either Canada or England, rather than live in the new Republic. In July of 1783, the British government established a commission to examine claims for compensation for damages incurred because one remained loyal to the crown. This commission functioned for seven years until 1790. It examined 4,118 claims and paid 3.2 million pounds in compensation. Hostility ceased and all British forces were to withdraw from land and sea with all convenient speed. These were the terms of the Treaty of Paris, signed on September 3rd, 1783, and ratified by Congress on January 14th, 1784. Uh, during the year 1783, while this was all being negotiated, uh, Spain had the satisfaction of retaking Florida from the English. The Spanish celebrated by rededicating the Church of Our Lady of Mobile in present-day Alabama uh, under the title of Our Lady of the Immaculate Conception. And as I mentioned in previous uh, sessions, this parish canonically would become the cathedral parish of Mobile when Mobile became a diocese. And, it, and it's an archdiocese, it, and later became an archdiocese, but that still remained the cathedral. Four years later, in 1787, ecclesiastical jurisdiction of Spanish Louisiana and Florida was moved to the newly created Diocese of Havana in Cuba. Uh, previously, it, it, was, it, was a, it was the Diocese of Santiago in Cuba, so now it's, it's, it remains in Cuba, but the Diocese of Havana. Five Irish priests trained at the University of Salamanca in Spain handle the sacramental duties with their base at St. Augustine on the Atlantic side of Florida, from which they reopened the mission in Pensacola on the Gulf, uh, Gulf of Mexico side of Florida. Spain then controlled political and ecclesiastical jurisdictions of the entire Mississippi River Valley from the Great Lakes down to the Gulf of Mexico, as well as the entire Gulf Coast from Texas, uh, well, Mexico and, and Texas, all the way to Florida. <clears throat> the following year, on the 9th of June, 1784, Father John Carroll was appointed superior of the American missions. His ecclesiastical rank was apostolic prefect the appointment was made by Pope Pius VI. The recognition of American independence by Great Britain 
confronted the Holy See with an unprecedented situation. The Apostolic Vicar of London, we already uh, discussed the background of that in a previous session, so I won't repeat it, uh, but that, uh, that person, the person holding that position, could no longer oversee the Catholics in the former English colonies because the New Republic of, of the United States was officially secular, but was populated by a Protestant majority at this, at this period uh, with a long tradition of enmity towards Catholicism, which we also covered in previous sessions. The official, the, 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 the uh, church official responsible for making a recommendation to the Pope in this situation was Lorenzo Cardinal Antonelli, prefect of the propagation of the faith. Since the New Republic had been allied, and still was, allied with France, Antonelli raised the issue with the papal nuncio to Paris. That's the ambassador of the Holy See to, well, to France, but it's based in Paris. Uh, he raised the issue on January 15th, 1783. Consultation expanded as this guy made his recommendation, said, you know, you should also talk to this guy. And then another one said, well, okay, then you should talk to this guy, you know, so that that's a consultation expanded. And, and at one point came to include Benjamin Franklin. You know, old Uncle Ben, he keeps finding his way into the story. And this, by this point, he was uh, in Paris as the, what they were calling then the American minister in Paris, but it, you know, we'd say an ambassador now, as American am ambassador to Paris. And consultation included writing to the few priests remaining alive in the former colonies, including John Carroll and a few other former Jesuits. When they received Antonelli's letter, they held a meeting together on June 27th, 1783, they talked for a while. They couldn't come up with a decision. Then they met a couple more times. And finally, uh, their written reply, which they sent back, was dated November 6th, 1783. The result of all of this consultation was that Cardinal Antonelli recommended and Pope Pius VI concurred to naming Father John Carroll apostolic prefect and superior of the American mission. In terms of holy orders, he remained a priest, not yet a bishop. But canonically, he had extra delegated faculties that an ordinary ordained priest would not have. So uh, here is, and the document has, has survived, so here is an excerpt um, from, the, from, the doc, from the Vatican document that brought this into being. It read in part, quote, in order to preserve and defend Catholicity, that's how they phrased it then, not Catholicism, Catholicity, in the 13 United States of North America, the Supreme Pontiff of the Church, Pius VI of that name, and this sacred congregation, meaning propagation of the faith, have thought it proper to designate a pastor who should attend to the spiritual necessities of the Catholic flock. As then, Reverend Sir, you, this, uh, uh, writing to John Carroll, as then you, uh, as then Reverend Sir, you have given conspicuous proofs of piety and zeal. And it is known that your appointment will please and gratify many members of the Republic, and especially Mr. Franklin, Ben Franklin, the eminent individual who represents the same Republic at the court of the most Christian king, King of France. The sacred congregation, with the approbation of His Holiness, has appointed you superior of the mission in the 13 United States of North America and has communicated to you the faculties which are necessary. The administration of confirmation is reserved for you alone. And it wrote others, but that's the submit. So, in addition to being an ordained priest, which he already was, he could also offer the sacrament of confirmation which normally would be reserved to a bishop. He could not ordain new priests, 
is that that is that is always reserved for a bishop, but it, it, but later he's going to become a bishop, of course. All right, uh, we mentioned his name a few times. I told you we'd cover his biography in due course, so here it is. John Carroll was born in Upper Marlboro, Maryland, on the eighth of January, seventeen thirty-six, into a family we've already met, the most influential Anglo-Catholic family in that period of American history. He was a second cousin of Charles Carroll of Carrollton, the guy who's uh, the one who signed the Declaration of Independence. And John was a son of Daniel Carroll, who signed the Constitution of the United States, which has not happened yet. We're, we're going to get to that. Anti-Catholic legislation in the English colonies prohibited the establishment of Catholic schools. So wealthy families like the Carrolls typically sent their children to be educated in one of the Catholic countries of Europe. Process we've already seen with all of the, the, the three, well, the, the second and third Charles, Charles, Charles's Carrolls. Um, John Carroll, along with his cousin Charles, were sent to a Jesuit school in present-day Belgium, St. Omer. But at the time, it was part of France. So they were able to travel throughout France on holidays. When their classics, when the classical studies was done, were done, uh, and college was done, then their paths separated for a time. As we saw, Charles went to study law and commerce, while John decided to, to stay and join the Society of Jesus and become a Jesuit, uh, which meant studying philosophy and theology. After completing philosophy and theology, at the Jesuit Anglo-Catholic Exile Seminary in Liège, Belgium, ruled by France at the time, John Carroll was ordained a priest on the 14th of February, 1761. The Society of Jesus, as we covered previously, was suppressed 12 years later in 1773 uh, for reasons we've already covered. So, because it was Catholic monarchs, it was Catholic monarchs who pressured the Pope to do this because they wanted to steal the Jesuit property. Um, and Clement the Thirteenth gave in. Uh, the order, the Jesuit order, did survive, ironically, in in non-Catholic countries, in Lutheran Prussia northern Germany, because the ruler, Frederick the Great, wanted to annoy the French. And it survived in Orthodox Russia, because Catherine the Great, who was, who was running things in Russia at the time, uh, valued Jesuits as educators. When John Carroll learned of the suppression of the society, he wrote to his mother, quote, the greatest blessing, which in my estimation, I could receive from God, would be immediate death. He did not receive immediate death, so he returned to his family in Maryland, an ordained priest for 12 years and still an ordained priest, even though his order was suppressed, but without that order, that religious order that had structured his life previously. Before covering his life back in the United States, it's important to note a few elements um, that he, that he uh, internalized from his time in Europe that would shape his ecclesiology, his theology of church, and in turn contribute to the development of ecclesial Americanism. Uh, let's summarize this in uh, four points. First, the education that he and other children of wealthy Anglo-American Catholics received when they went to Belgium and France was strongly influenced by 18th century French rationalism of the Enlightenment. Because um, that was, I mean, that was just, that was the world at the time. And we already, you know, we already covered the, the reasons for that. Uh, you know, rationalism was a, was a reaction against the, the Catholic Protestant Wars for 130 years. Uh, and, you know, so rationalism, the age of science, the, the reason was seen as a protection from religion. And that some rationalists believe, you know, all religions should just be eliminated. That was, it's a rational superstition, a, a residue of the Middle Ages, and should just be erased. Others did not go that far, but did believe that religion should be, should be quarantined that it should just be a personal affair, something that's kept inside of church, 
in order to protect the rest of society from it. And they, I mean, that's just, that's that the intelligentsia of the 18th century of all, of all the Western countries tended to share those, those biases. And those are the kind of people who are going to teach, you know, and so that's, it's natural that the students, I mean, that's how it got propagated. So they, they, they internalized that. This meant that the ecclesiology John Carroll was taught in seminary was Gallicanism, uh, which, which is, um, uh, it, it, it's an ecclesi it's a national church ecclesiology, essentially. Uh, not quite as, as far as the Anglicans, because the Gallicans did not want to actually break from Rome. But they believed in matters of internal governance that each that the, the church hierarchy in each country should govern the church in that country and just recognize the Pope as a spiritual figurehead, you know, to whom they would give reverence and honor, a symbol of unity, uh, but not but that the Pope would not have actual jurisdiction. So that's what they internalized. Second, another aspect of this rationalist influence was a heavy anti-authoritarian attitude directed against the claims of divine right of kings being asserted by European monarchs, both Catholic and Protestant. So remember, rationalism is not just anti-Catholic. I mean, that's the part we, you know, we focus on because obviously I'm teaching this for seminarians, but, um, it was anti-religious. Rationalism was anti-religious. So they, they viewed with repugnance any, any assertion to authority by divine right. You know, because they, they, they regarded religion as just superstitions, you know, so that, you know, they, they would see it as no different than, as claiming authority by, by right of, of Zeus or Apollo. So the, this, this, and this anti-authoritarian attitude uh, in many enlightenment rationalists resulted in writings proposing a republic as a preferable substitute for monarchy. And in a, in a republic, they, they thought, I mean, you know, they, they, they're idealizing this. Uh, their republic, it would be like Plato's. These were all guys were all classically trained, so they read Plato's Republic. And if, if you know, some of you may have had that inflicted on you in, in your course of your education. If not, Plato's Republic was a very idealized society, the type that has never, ever, ever, ever existed in, in all of human history. Uh, but it, uh, Plato asserted as this ideal that the Republic would be guided by men of merit and education and property. The better types, you see, that, you know, those, those, those who were endowed with the gifts to tell other people what to do. And uh, rather than, but the rationalists saw that as preferable uh, because it would, they saw it as a merit-based leadership rather than leadership based on inherited title. American founding fathers like Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin also imbibed this thought because these writings were first put forward in the French milieu and both of those, both Jefferson and Franklin were fluent in French. Third, yet another aspect of this rationalist influence was a strong tendency toward deism, which made John Carroll and Catholics who shared his attitude uncomfortable with and at times bordering on hostile to distinctly Catholic devotional practices like novenas, processions, sacred art. Now, it would be going too far to say that John Carroll himself was a deist, but it is fair to say that hearing rationalist mockery of Catholic devotional practices for his entire education, uh, the, I mean, education that would correspond to high school, junior college, uh, actual college, you know, what we think of as culminating a bachelor's degree, plus graduate school, plus theology. You know, I mean, hearing that for his high, you know, 15 years of, of his education, hearing this mockery would make him embarrassed by such spirituality. And with his English background, 
especially, you know, that, um, which we covered with George Calvert, he knew what happened. Now, he, you know, he was, he was too young to have actually witnessed it, um, but he knew what happened to the Catholics in Ireland, you know, when the English asserted their, uh, you know, their, their occupation and reduced Ireland to, to a, a colony and imposed the penal laws, disenfranchised the population, stole their property, deprived them of civil rights, you know, and all the stuff that we covered when we introduced George Carroll. So for him, so for him you know, with this background, distinctly de Catholic devotional practices were doubly dangerous. First, there was the danger of, of superstition, which I don't, I don't really buy that as a danger, but he, he would have bought that, you know, after hearing the rationalist mockery so long. And the second danger, uh, you know, since he knew he was ultimately going to go back to the to the an English an Anglo milieu, uh, and even after the Republic, after the United States was founded, it, it still was an Anglo milieu, Protestant milieu. So it had the second danger of of drawing attention to Catholics who were a tiny minority, and so attention from a hostile Protestant majority is not something that was desirable. As a result, Carroll himself avoided, tended to avoid such devotional practices, and he never encouraged them as a bishop. And the kind of priest he recruited, you know, uh, you know, he, he became like he became the model. Like when he, especially, you know, when he starts getting, he needed a priest who come from European countries. Okay, well, how do we how do we function here? Well, they looked to him as a, as a model, and this. So this is a distinct type of American ecclesiology, the very accommodationist, you know, not, not where, where, the, where just Catholics among themselves practice Catholicism, but do not, you know, overtly draw attention to themselves as Catholic. That's one category of American ecclesiology, which is going to, ent to, to, to um, enter into conflict with, with a later category of American ecclesiology brought over by European immigrants, many of whom came to this country fleeing persecution because of their faith and, and coming here because they were free to practice openly. Which even, which Carroll, even though, even after the, after the revolution, he would have been free to do this openly, by preference he did not. Whereas, you know, the other immigrants who came, like the Irish who came, who, who were persecuted for their faith, uh, the Poles who came, uh, is they were persecuted when, you know, when, when, if they came from parts of Poland that had been uh, conquered by Lutheran Prussia or Orthodox Russia, they came. Uh, Italians, you know, was, uh, if, they, if they would dominate, if they went parts of, of Italy where they, you know, where they uh, were not free to practice their faith or, uh, although they, they tended to come anyway. Um, uh, any, and even uh, some, some from Catholic countries who were fleeing prejudice from rationalists, you know, rationalism. So they came and, and they wanted to be overt. They wanted to build the huge churches. They wanted to have devotions. They wanted to have processions through the streets with statues of Our Lady. They wanted to have the novenas. They wanted to, you know, and, and if, these, uh, if, the, you know if, if the others didn't like it, well, too bad. You know, we're free to do it. And so those two, that's, that's going to be yet another source of tension and conflict in our history. That we've seen the schizophrenia in so many levels from the beginning. The issue of authority with government. The issue of slavery versus freedom. Uh, the issue of taxation. You know, that we, we want to keep all of our money, yet we also want government services. You know, all, all the, those issues are going to be there. The, um, local authority versus central authority. And now we have the religion. Should religion be a private affair only? You know, or, or I mean, how public should it be? I mean, legally, you know, there were, in, the, in the Republic, you were obviously free. But um, should you? That was the question. You know, just because you're free to, to be overt in public, in your faith, should you? Is that healthy for the republic, for a society that is officially secular by law? And that, that's a tension, yet another source of tension that's that's has been present from the beginning and is still with us today. So the, the fights in the church between liberals and conservatives, you know, Vatican II was not the first time that happened, right? So seminarians, you know, know this, know this to be true, be prepared.
Fourth, the suppression of the Jesuits by the Holy See was personally a shattering blow to John Carroll and most of the Jesuits at the time, because none of them were aware. Is Carroll at the, I mean, you know, we, we think of him as, because he later was so important, you know, we think, well, he must have been in the know, but he, at this point he was just a, a young priest. So no, he didn't know. He didn't know all the, what was going on, all the pressure and threats being, ex, you know, uh, 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 the menacing that was taking place of the Pope by, the, by, uh, by allegedly Catholic monarchs. From their perspective, Carroll's perspective and other uh, priests like uh, of his age, it was a completely arbitrary and unjust action. So for the rest of his life, John Carroll mistrusted the Holy See. Uh, there, there is, now biographers don't agree on this, this next point, or sub point, because uh, we're still with point four. Uh, so know that, t take that as a caveat. Um, there is, I'll put it this way, that uh, those who want to believe it can find some evidence in his writing uh, to support the characterization that he rejected the assertion of papal jurisdiction over the universal church, as his Gallican teachers did, believing that the Pope did have jurisdiction over the Diocese of Rome, but that for the rest of the church, the Pope should be only a spiritual figurehead. Again, with that same caveat, there is evidence for those, you know, you know, to characterize uh, that Carroll rejected claims to infallibility as a personal charism of the Holy Father, instead regarding infallibility as a charism residing in the body of the faithful, the census fidelium, you know, for you seminarians, I'm sure you've encountered that in other courses. So those two things, you know, that biographers argue about that in, in, a, in a, a level of detail that we, we don't have time to cover. But what we do know from his actions is that he consistently withheld information from Rome. He did send reports, and they were full of numbers. You know, and we're, we're going to quote from at least one or two of them. They were full of numbers, and they did have news. So he never refused to communicate with Rome, ever. But they were, they were vague about uh, some of the... Um, they were vague in some of the categories that Rome typically needed uh, substantiated by their bishops on the ground in missionary countries. Uh, you know, like the bishop's personal view of, uh, of, of the, the nature of the church, the ecclesiology, the way it should fit in there. Uh, you know, he's very, he's very vague on that. And, you know, possibly deliberately so. Um, you know, because he knew that Rome would not, or either either he thought Rome would could never possibly understand this new thing called the United States. Um, you know, or he just didn't trust him because of what happened to the Jesuits. The uh, the Jesuits, and another thing we know for a fact, is that the Jesuits and the colony at the time of the suppression incorporated themselves in law, in commercial law as the Society of the Reverend Gentlemen in order to preserve what had been the property of the Jesuit order. And this is, this is going to, uh, later, this is going to lead us, slavery is going to come back into our story with this. Um, well, anyway, we'll, we'll get to it. Just, just know that uh, uh, Carroll was never excommunicated because he never published these views in a format that Rome could read. It can be seen in, in some letters. And he's never overt. So, I mean, there's no, there's no letter you can point to and say, this demonstrates that Carroll's a heretic, you know, or, or a schismatic or anything. So it, it's just, but you can, you know, read, seeing them in aggregate, because there are a lot of them over a period of years. You know, you can see these attitudes in there, that he was scarred, he felt betrayed, you know, by the church as a young man. And, uh, you know, he, his faith survived. You know, there's no evidence that he was a deist. He, he believed in God, you know, and he believed in the in Catholicism. He believed in the sacraments. You know, there's no doubt he ever doubted any of that. No, there's no evidence he ever doubted any of that. Uh, but the scars remained.
I'll uh, leave it like that. <clears throat> Upon receiving his appointment in the form of a letter from Cardinal Antonelli dated June 9th, Apostolic Prefect Father John Carroll took up residence in Baltimore, Maryland, as it was the city with the largest Catholic population at the time. He set the tone for Anglo-Catholics in the New Republic by continuing to live very much as he had under the colonial government because he wished to avoid antagonizing the Protestant establishment since they were in charge of the government. Even though, you know, it was not a, Protestantism was not established as a church legally, he, that, that numerically there were more Protestants in the government than, than Catholics. For example, Carroll uh, did not exercise the right that he now had in the Republic that he did not have in the colonial period to wear religious garb in public. Instead, he continued to just to wear the suit, uh, the, the black suit, as priests in the English colonies had, uh, because that's Protestant ministers also wore the black suit. You know, that, that's uh, what they, what, it's just what they did. So where, whereas in European countries like France, uh, in Spain and Italy, uh, the priest at this period would have worn the, the cassock or the soutane, you know, the long black robe. But uh, since the Protestant ministers in the 13 colonies in public just wore the black suit, so that's what Carroll did. And even though he could have started wearing the cassock in public, in the, in the Republic, he didn't. He wore vestments in mass, you know, to say mass, obviously, but not, uh, not just walking on the street. Another example, he regularly invited prominent Protestants to attend his sermons. And they were very well received. You know, he, he had an excellent education. He was, you know, he, and, and like the Protestant ministers of his day, he wrote them all out beforehand in essay format. And many of them were subsequently published in pamphlet form and so got circulated. That's something else Protestant ministers did. Uh, and in these, well, many of which have survived, he combined patriotism for the New Republic with emphasis on the ethical value of the gospel, the Beatitudes, the commandments, love God, love neighbor. You know, while we're, we're not emphasizing the distinctly Catholic elements like devotion to the saints, or devotion to Our Lady, you know, novenas, the rosary, that kind of thing. And he became involved in many civic activities. For example, he was uh, one of the founders uh, of the Maryland Historical Society. He served as president of the Board of Trustees of Baltimore College which was a secular college. He was a founding trustee, not the only one, but he was one of, one of the founding trustees of St. John's College in Annapolis, which was a classical college, meaning, you know, Greek and Latin, that officially had no religious affiliation, but which had a majority student body of, of Protestants, as, you know, and the faculty were mostly Anglicans. He served uh, for a term as president, this is just what it was called, of the Female Humane Society, uh, which was for widows and, and women otherwise in distress. And this, so this is, again, this is this set a template for one type of American bishop. You know, the, a public figure heavily involved in civic activities would be friend of the, of the governing establishment and, and you know, because it was accommodationist, you know, not, not overtly in your face Catholic, he tended to get invited. And bishops like him would get invited to, you know, to public events and, you know, would be one of those included. They might ask a, you know, a Protestant minister, a Calvinist minister, an Anglican minister, and, a, and, and him or, or a Catholic bishop, you know, to all give invocations. You know, whereas uh, the other category of bishop who we'll meet later in the course, who was the more the fortress, you know, the Catholic fortress mentality type and in your face Catholic, you know, they tended to not be that way, you know, just tended to focus on the flock. And I, I mean, I'm not saying which one is right or right. I was just saying that this, 
that that the liberal conservative fight, the liberal conservative antipathy, did not just start with Vatican II and the post-Vatican II period. It's been present with us from the beginning. In the same year that John Carroll was appointed apostolic prefect of the new United States, uh, we, we find another turning point in the history of Catholicism on the other side of the continent in California. 66 years before it became one of the United States when it was still part of Spain. Which brings us back to Unipero Serra. Uh, on the 1st of July, 1784, uh, he made what turned out to be his final report uh, on his missionary efforts in California. So to refresh your memory, uh, Sarah departed Spain for the New World at the age of 36 in 1749. This report is 35 years later, after establishing nine of California, what would eventually grow into 21 Franciscan missions. Sarah died eight weeks after writing this report. He died on August 28, 1784, at the mission of San Carlos in Monterey, California. And as I mentioned previously, he was buried beneath the sanctuary floor of that mission church. Um, let's see. Yeah, I listed all that already. So in this report, um, adding it all together, 70, uh, no, 4,646 uh, indigenous people were living in the nine missions, just, I mean, distributed, added together, living in the nine missions he established. And the Franciscans continued that mission strategy, establishing a total of 21, which at their peak had 20,000 indigenous peoples living in them. Their economic success brought them under the, the same predatory gaze of, of a greedy government that affected the other Franciscan missions in Mexico and Spain and which affected the Jesuits in Portugal, France, Spain, Belgium, and the other Catholic countries of Europe, uh, which resulted in the theft of, you know, the government theft of, of church property. In one act, uh, later the newly independent Mexican government, and we'll, we'll cover that later, uh, stole, just simply nationalized, uh, the Franciscan missions in 1833. It was not until California entered the United States that proper ecclesiastical organization could be restored in the area. And some of the missions uh, reopened for service. Unipero Serra was beatified by Pope, well, later St. John Paul himself, St. John Paul II, in 1988. And Serra was canonized by Pope Francis in 2015 as part of that Pope's first visit to the United States. And that was the first canonization ceremony to take place on American soil. Sarah's feast in the United States is July 1st. In the same year that Sarah died, uh, John Carroll became apostolic prefect. Uh, and in that same year, 1784, Catholicism in the new United States was directly attacked by a former Catholic priest uh, named Charles Henry Wharton, W-H-A-R-T-O-N. Wharton came from exactly the same background as John Carroll, but made different decisions at key points in his life. He was born in Maryland to a Catholic family on the plantation. Theirs was Notley Hall. He was a grandson of Lord Baltimore. Uh, well, of one of the Lord, Lord's, one of the last Lord Baltimore. In 1760, his family sent him to Europe to study. They sent him to Carroll's alma mater, the English Jesuit College in, at St. Omer. And for the same reasons, because it was, could not have Catholic schools in the English colonies. One difference is that he was younger than Carroll. 
uh, Wharton was ordained a transitional deacon for the Jesuits. He also decided to become a Jesuit. Uh, but he was ordained a transitional deacon in June of 1772. However, the Jesuit order was suppressed one month before Wharton was scheduled to be ordained a priest. Therefore, he was ordained by the English apostolic vicar as a secular priest, not a Jesuit. So that's one difference, that Carroll had not only all of his Jesuit formation, but was also for a dozen years was a Jesuit priest before it was suppressed. Whereas this happened right at that transition time, you know, between, uh, but, you know, after diaconate, but before priesthood. Whether that's the, you know, the, the, the reason for what happened later, or if it was just one factor among many, who knows. But that is the chronology. Uh, uh, the new Father Wharton divided his time between the English College in Rome, uh, the English exile uh, uh, college in Belgium, with periodic clandestine visits to England in disguise. He even visited American prisoners of war being held in English POW camps during the revolution. Of course, he had to do that secretly also. Could not reveal that he was a Catholic priest. Father Wharton returned uh, after the, the 13 colonies won, you know, after it was the United States uh, in 1783. In the very first vessel that sailed, uh, well, at least sailed from, from France after the peace. In May of 1784, he, he converted to the Church of England. He left, he left the Catholic Church. And he published an essay in pamphlet form for wider circulation titled Letter to the Roman Catholics of Worcester, published in Philadelphia, 1784. And he became rector of Emmanuel Church, Anglican, uh, later Episcopal, and we'll talk about that transition shortly, uh, in uh, Delaware, Newcastle, Delaware. In this letter, to Roman Catholics, Wharton argued that, uh, remember, this is the Articles of the Confederation government for the United States. The Constitution with the First Amendment, that, that, hasn't, that, hasn't, that doesn't exist yet. So this is an argument to people living under the Articles of Confederation, which is a very loose central government, as we talked about earlier. So he argued that the, uh, the new Episcopal Church which was uh, the, the former Anglican church in the colonies that decided to, to remain in the United States. Some of the Anglican clergy, Church of England just went back to England after England lost. But those who remained, both, both clergy and laity, who remained in the United States, uh, they, they form the Episcopal Church. They could no longer be Church of England because it wasn't England. So that, that's what the Episcopal Church was. So he argued that this new Episcopal Church should be granted established status in the Republic, just as Anglicanism had established status in England, meaning it would be, it would be the national church and the clergy would be on the payroll. By way of contrast, Wharton argued that Roman Catholicism was contrary to the ideals of this new republic because Catholicism is contrary to the ideals of a free society because the Catholic Church is structured in a hierarchical fashion, you know, from the Pope, you know, down to, to the newborn infant, you know, that everyone has a, has a level in the hierarchy. Further, he argued that, uh, that he was not the last one to argue. This just became a, a trope uh, that uh, Catholics could not be. Catholics are incapable of being good citizens because they owe prior allegiance to a foreign Italian prince. That's the Pope. So what about other Protestant denominations? You know, why... why 
Why not Methodists? You know, why not Presbyterians? Why shouldn't they be the national, the established church? Well, he addressed that too. Other Protestant denominations, such as the Calvinist Puritans of the Scottish Presbyterians, were by their nature, he asserted, it's not, he asserted, uh, were unreliable because of their, uh, their essential anti-authoritarian ethos. Only, his conclusion, only an American version of Anglicanism could provide the structured unity of a common religious creed necessary to support this infant religious, this infant American Republic. Uh, Carol is going to respond to that. Uh, as we'll see. So, uh, to, fill, to fill out some of the background, legal disabilities imposed on Catholics because of the English anti-popery laws were reversed by legislation at the state level in the New Republic, but at a differentiated pace. And even, therefore, early, even into the early national period, some states retained anti-Catholic statutes on their books into the 19th century when they were technically in violation of federal law. But, you know, they had, they had such tiny Catholic population, you know, or no Catholics at all that it just didn't get on the radar. Uh, whereas uh, Virginia, which we mentioned earlier, adopted a Bill of Rights on the 12th of June, 1776 a month before the Declaration of Independence, embodying the principles of religious freedom, meaning no established church, no taxes paid to support any church. Pennsylvania and Maryland did the same thing before that year ended. Whereas, you know, to look at some others, New York and Massachusetts retained their their colonial period anti-Catholic legislation, which we covered earlier in the course. Uh, Pennsylvania issued its own Declaration of Rights on the 28th of September, 1776. Section 2 read in part, quote, that all men have a natural and unalienable right to worship Almighty God according to the dictates of their own conscience and understanding. Maryland issued a Declaration of Rights on the 11th of November, 1776. Article 33 read in part, quote, that as it is the duty of every man to worship God in such manner as he thinks most acceptable to him, all persons professing the Christian religion are equally entitled to protection in their religious liberty. Wherefore, no person ought by any law to be molested in his person or estate on account of his religious persuasion or profession or for his religious practices unless under color of religion any man shall disturb the good order, peace, or safety of the state, or shall infringe the laws of morality, or injure others in their natural, civil, or religious rights. And if you were listening carefully, uh, you notice a difference. The Pennsylvania Declaration would apply to everyone including Jews, Muslims, well, there were no Muslims that we know of yet in the United States, but it would apply to Jews because it said, uh, unalienable right to worship Almighty God, according to their kind, whereas the Maryland statute, uh, all persons professing the Christian religion are equally entitled to protection. So it would not apply to non-Christians. But it did have that, uh, 
you know that that idea that that you know you can practice your religion up to the point where where it where it intrudes on someone else and like, like you know it's, there is that that american idea you know that that religion you know it's not quite as far as the european rationalist where religion should be completely quarantined but that you know it should not not be so public that it causes problems new york uh, uh, uh had a constitution adopted on the 20th of april 1777 the following year article 38 read in part quote and whereas we are required by the benevolent principles of rational liberty not only to expel civil tyranny but also to guard against that spiritual oppression and intolerance wherewith the bigotry and ambition of weak and wicked priests and princes have scourged mankind uh, further down, a uh, later article, let's see, that's uh, Article 62. Uh, those seeking citizenship shall take an oath of allegiance to this state and abjure and renounce all allegiance and subjection to all and every foreign king, prince, potentate, and state in all matters ecclesiastical as well as civil so this is this is not freedom of religion you see that this is the new york 1777 uh, massachusetts constitution uh, promulgated three years later uh, now this one was ratified by popular vote in massachusetts not just the legislature uh, ratified on june 7th 1780 article 3 read in part quote the people of this commonwealth have a right to invest their legislature with power to authorize and require the several towns, parishes, precincts, and other bodies politic or religious societies to make suitable provision at their own expense for the institution of the public worship of God and for the support and maintenance of public Protestant teachers of piety, religion, and morality in all cases where such provision shall not be made voluntarily. So Massachusetts went even farther. And you remember, so the, the Constitution this is another reason why the Constitution was written the way it was with regard to religion, because the states were all over the place. And under the Articles of the Constitution, that was permissible. So here you have Mar Pennsylvania, everybody, worship Almighty God anywhere you want. Maryland, all Christians are free to worship anywhere they want. Uh, New York, have to abjure. So Catholics would have to take this oath to abjure any loyalty to the Pope. Whereas Massachusetts went even farther and actually did have an established church, although they didn't. It, this, it didn't say a particular denomination, but said tax money would be used for the for the support and maintenance of Protestant teachers of piety, religion, and morality, which means, of course, those studies would be required. You know, and, and, and tax money is going to, and that and that one was vote was ratified by popular vote in Massachusetts. Okay, so did this violate the Articles of Confederation? Well, let's see. Uh, the Articles, uh, with in terms of religion, the um, document where well it was well it was ratified on the first of March, seventeen seventy seven. Article three: The said states hereby severally enter into a firm league of friendship with each other for their common defense, the security of their liberties binding themselves to assist each other against all force offered to or attack made upon them or any of them on account of religion, sovereignty, trade, or any other pretense whatsoever. And that's it. That's all the article says about religion. It's the only time I find the word religion in the articles 
is that uh, that the states and their alliance they had to agree if any one of the states was attacked on the grounds of religion then they all had to come to the defense but other than that there was nothing in the articles that prevented this wide divergence of religious policy in the constituent states now jumping forward uh the con just so you have it all together in your notes seminarians uh the constitution of the united states was adopted a decade later after after that uh adopted on the 17th of September, 1787. The government of, of this new constitution was inaugurated on the 30th of April, 1789. And the first 10 amendments, the Bill of Rights, went into effect on the 15th of December, 1791. And we'll, I'll go into more detail about the background later, but so you have all the religious policy stuff together. Article six of the constitution, quote, no religious test shall ever be required as a qualification to any office or public trust under the United States. So in part, that is a response to the New York constitutional thing from the, uh, that, was, that was 10 years earlier, which required a specific oath abjuring uh, re you know, religious loyalty to whatever religion. It didn't specify Catholic, but to any. And the First Amendment to the Bill of Rights, uh, quote, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. So that's addressing in part the Massachusetts state constitution of the previous decade, which did have an established church. I mean, established in the sense that tax money was going to be used to fund Protestant ministers to be public teachers of, as I said, morality, ethics, and piety. So as response, and that's why it's, it's phrased very carefully in a very limited, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. And that's it. The two bookends. No law establishing, no law prohibiting. So, uh, Okay, so that's all together in one unit. So rewinding to 1784 to catch up with some other things that were going on. Uh, the, uh, the Articles of Confederation had a number of, of uh, lacunae, as we, as we covered, a number of gaps. Uh, one of them being in terms of trade, international trade, and treaties, commercial treaties. So the, uh, the reason the Articles did not last that long and, and the, the impetus for it being replaced by a stronger federal government uh, can be traced to this event. On the 30th of August, 1784, Captain John Green, an American merchant, not a naval captain, but a merchant, you know, merchant captain, sailed uh, his ship uh, named the Empress of China, sailed into Canton, China, after sailing from New York, all the way, and remember, there's no Panama Canal yet, so I had to sail all the way around South America, go around the, the uh, uh, Cape Horn at the tip of South America, then all the way across the Pacific to get to, well, he did, he did Australia, and then, you know, but eventually to get to, uh, to, to China. Um, he traded in China for a cargo of tea and silk. He returned all that way. Uh, he returned in May of 1785, and he made so much money from that one shipload of Chinese tea and silk that uh, the United States has been involved with China ever since. And it's always been this, this, this kind of love-hate relationship. You know, there's this desire for the money, for the markets, you know, in, in China, but there's also this fear and mistrust. Initially, it was fear because China had an absolute monarchy. The, 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 it was an empire. I mean, it was it ruled by an emperor, so that it was not a free society. Therefore, it was the antithesis of the new republic. But yet, it, so there was a fear of that. And yet, there's all that money. All that money <laughs> can be made. You know, at this, at this period, it was the silk and the, uh, and the tea. And, and in each, each generation, there's going to be something that we see 
you know that, that money could be made and so again another 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 item of this tension that still exists with us over china policy you know do we do we, do we want the openness to china the open door to china you know like nixon and kissinger you know or 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 do we do we do we fear them you know, like the anti-communists, uh, you know, the or before the anti the anti imperial you know, anti-monarch. You know, do we fear them? Do we fear their influence? You know, do we want their money or do we fear their money? You know, do do we want the anyway, you get the point. So it goes again, another another thing. There's nothing new. There's nothing new. But you see nobody studies history. So every time something oh wow, China oh this is the seventeen eighty four. Seventeen eighty four. It drives me nuts, you know, as a history person. I, I, I get nobody, like, there's nothing new. This, this has all happened before. All right. So, uh, the same year, the United States uh, imported $3.6 million worth of goods from Great Britain, but only exported $749,000 worth of goods to Great Britain. Whereas this guy made one million dollars from one ship one the one shipload of cargo from china that's a million dollars in 18th century money when the total trade in the same year that the total trade with great britain was 3.6 million therefore the desire of american merchants to negotiate stable trade agreements with china britain and later other foreign markets revealed one of the weaknesses in the Articles of Confederation. States had so much autonomy under the Articles government that the, the, the central government did not have the authority to negotiate any agreement that was binding on all states, such that regardless of any treaty, for example, a trade agreement that would be signed between the Articles of Confederation and China, any state could add an extra tax or extra fees at will. So if they negotiated this agreement, you know, that China was going to do trade with New York, say the New York port. But then it's, since they had to sail all the way around South America too, it might, well, why not, why not, why not debark at Savannah instead or Charleston, you know, or Baltimore, you know, and it, but any of those states, Georgia, uh, uh, South Carolina, Maryland, if they wanted to, they could add extra fees for trade, you know, to make money for the state. Even though, even if those fees were not in the treaty negotiated by the Articles government, and there and there was and that was legal, there was nothing binding on the states. They could do that. So that's one, you know, one one merchants got got annoyed with that. Uh, this economic instability created by the, the staggering economic opportunities of trade with China, prompted debate for a substitute form of government with a stronger central authority, at least in terms of negotiating treaties and regulating commerce between the states. So that's what triggered, 1784, that's what triggered the, you know, the, the, the sequence of events that culminated in the Constitution. Same year, 1784. Apostolic Prefect John Carroll, in his capacity as the ranking Catholic prelate in the nation, responded to Charles Wharton's anti-Catholic diatribe in a 115-page essay, again published in pamphlet, well, almost book form, you know, large pamphlet, titled An Address to the Roman Catholics of the United States of America, published in Annapolis, Maryland. Uh, in it, he proposed his argument we can summarize. First, the violent conflicts between Catholics and Protestants were a vestige of European history. And those were as violent and enduring as they had been because they were entwined with the endless dynastic wars that had long predated Martin Luther, long predated the Reformation. I mean, long before that, the Germans and the French hated each other and had been slaughtering each other. Yeah, long before that, the Poles and the Russians hated each other and had been slaughtering each other. 
you know, and and, and the, 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 the Dutch and the Spanish, the same way, you know. So, like, none of that just started, Carol's point is, none of that just started because of religion. Even though the rationalists were blaming religion for it, it's just, you know, religion was used by those who were perpetuating and continuing centuries-long conflicts to give it a masquerade of a higher purpose, when in reality, the wars were fought for the same reasons that they had been fought before, to steal somebody else's land, to, you know, to subjugate their population, to suck their resources, whatever those happen to be, you know, for, for their own, or, you know, for, or for pride, you know, we want that, that country just, you know, just because, just to add it to our own. So it was fought for the same reasons, but religion was used, so that long predated Martin Luther. And because of that, because of the political and economic factors, the, the wars of religion between Catholic and Protestant were, were much more violent and long-lasting than they would have been had the political and economic considerations not been there. Second, the installation of the Atlantic Ocean between the United States and Europe not only provides physical protection from Europe, is that they can't just march, you know, over and, and try to steal from us. But it also enables something priceless, something which previously had not existed for the Europeans, or, or anyone else for that matter, but priceless. It enables a fresh start, unfettered by the memories of, European, of Europe's, the way he phrases it, military and religious ghosts. We no longer need to be haunted by that. So somebody from Germany or France, you know, somebody from, you know, France, say, comes over here, and somebody from Germany comes over here. Once they're over here, they don't have to hate each other. They don't have to fight each other. Just because if they were in Europe, they would have had to. They would have been conscripted into the armies of their various kings and have to slaughter each other for no reason of their own, just because that's, that's what they had to do. But once they're over here, they don't have to. Third. A free republic can only exist, Carroll asserted, if there is total freedom of religion. And freedom of religion can only exist if there is no established church at all. So he was not arguing that the Catholic Church should be established instead of the Episcopal Church. He said, no established church at all. Fourth, in such an environment, with the physical insulation of the of the ocean, the, the the political insulation of having no established church, or the political insulation of a republic, and the ecclesial insulation of no established church. In that environment, Carroll concluded, it would be possible to restore all Christians to the unity of faith that should never have been lost in the first place. Now, very idealistic, of course, that, that isn't what happened, but that's, that's, the, that, that's his vision. And so this document, what I talked about earlier in the intro, some of that is inferred from his letters, but this is a published document. And, you know, and he put his name to it. It wasn't, a, you know, there was no pen name like, you know, like Charles Carroll signed at First Citizen. This was him. He was writing as Father John Carroll, Apostolic Prefect uh, of Catholics in the New Republic. And this, this is a foundational document for ecclesial American Catholicism, or ecclesial Americanism. Um, and, the, and the ideals are, 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 still, are still there. Now, with air travel, you know, it travels a lot easier now than it was in his time. So, the, you know, the ocean is not the insulation that it once was. And political entanglements much more than there were in the 18th century. So, you know, we're not as free. You know, we can't leave behind. Like, even those who come, still come from other countries, they're not necessarily as free to leave behind the ghosts, you know, as, as, they, as they were in the 18th century. But they still, you know, the fresh start, that idea of the fresh start, that, 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 that is something that was new in the human experience. And initially for Europe, but then others, other parts of the world, you know, found that too. Uh, yeah, come here and have a fresh start. Uh, Carroll, as I said, he, he never refused to report to Rome, but he, his reports were tailored in a very specific way. His first report on Catholicism in the New Republic to Rome 
was largely statistical. He asked, and which, which has value, of course, uh, he estimated that there were 24,500 Catholics living in the 13, well, not states, now 13 states. They, they were served. They were the seminarians that do this math. In 13 states, there were 24 and a half thousand Catholics served by 19 priests in Maryland and five in Pennsylvania who spent their lives riding the circuit through the other states. Of those priests, five were at or near the age of 70. Maryland had the most Catholics, 15,800. Pennsylvania had the next at 7,000. At the end of the letter, Carroll noted an ominous development. Quote, Priests are maintained chiefly from the proceeds of the estates. Elsewhere, by the liberality of Catholics. There is, properly speaking, no ecclesiastical property here. For the property by which the priests are supported is held in the name of individuals and transferred by will to devisees. This course was rendered necessary when the Catholic religion was cramped here by laws and no remedy has yet been found for this difficulty. End quote. Okay, let that sink in. Uh, so what is he talking about? The proceeds from the estates? He's referring to the former Jesuit property, which after the suppression, the surviving Jesuits who became secular priests like him, incorporated that property under the corporation of the Society of the Reverend Gentlemen. The proceeds of that estate, of those estates, which included plantations, slave work plantations. I'm, I'm sorry, that, that's, that's just what happened. I, I don't know what to say. It's just, just, it was Maryland, it was tobacco plantations. I, you know. um, so the proceeds from those estates are what supported the, the clergy. Uh, elsewhere, he says, by liberality of Catholics, so like the ones in Pennsylvania, that there were no plantations there. So it was just and essentially passed in the basket. That, that, that's how priests were supported. So his next point about this, properly speaking, no ecclesiastical property here. So uh, that's because the state corporations are created by states, state law. And the states, as we've seen, were all over the place under the Articles of Confederation. Um, and so there were no protections for, uh, for the way Catholic ecclesiology operated. So the, the, the religious property laws were tailored for Protestant ecclesiology, which is just independent congregations. And the congregation, you know, they might, they might buy land, put a church on it. Uh, some of them might have a house, you know, for their minister, or they might just pay their minister enough and let him get his own housing. Uh, they might have a hall, but, but that's it. I mean, it wouldn't be, you know, like we think of as dioceses now with hundreds of parishes and literally some of them hundreds of parishes and schools and convents and some hospitals and nursing homes. And, uh, and so the law, the law wasn't written that way to, for, for, to, have, to have religious fiduciary corporations like that for that much property. So he said that's what he means when he says there's no ecclesiastical property here. So a uh, priest like as we, we saw with one of the early missionary priests um, in uh, Indiana, he, he just he bought it himself. He bought property himself and, um, and put the church on it, you know, and he lived on it, uh, but it was in his name. So in order for it to support the next priest, he would have to, in his will, leave it to that next priest. And if he died intestate with no will, well, then what? Now, he, he was in a part, in an area that, that wasn't a state, wasn't one of the colonies, it was a territory. So, you know, who knows, who knows probably would have just, just, just you know, been stolen. But even in the, in the states, that's, that's what, if it was an individual priest, then that's what he would have to do. Um, uh, okay, so the, this, this problem, uh, which Carol, th this is the first mention that we can date and document uh, 
let's see, it was rest report. Oh, I have the doubt, I have the number. Uh, it's uh, 1785. Uh, of the trusteeism. Trusteeism. The trusteeism problem. Which was the first internal ecclesial problem for the United States in the New Republic. And one that endured throughout the 19th century. And, and, and oddly, I mean, the remedy ended up being in secular law. When, as as uh, as as the writing of corporate law became more detailed and more diversified, uh, then a solution could finally be found. Okay, so this unit is uh, this is going to be uh, trusteeism. Actually, I might just yeah, I'll just I'll stop here because I see this 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 has been going on for a while. So I'll stop here and we'll start the next section uh, with trusteeism. Uh, thank you for your attention. This session is adjourned.